your fire crank is possible. Uh, my father, he will get me some when he's finished out of the barber shop. Well, you may have a long wait the way that barber's cutting hair in there. Barber, tell me something. You and Jenny Holcomb went steady for five years. That's right. Now, how come all of a sudden you decided you didn't want to be friends no more? What, what the devil are you talking about, Sam? You hear that, Rodriguez? He, he wants to know what the devil I'm talking about. Well, what about. are you talking about? Everybody knows Jenny and me's getting married next week. That's exactly what I am talking about. My wife and me, we got along real amiable-like until we got married. And then, my, oh, my. I tell you, Barbie, you just ain't got good sense. <laughs> now, you laugh. You laugh while you can. Because after next week, your laughing days is over, <laughs> well, I've seen an awful lot of laughing, but not much cutting. Frank, how can you take so much time cutting so little hair? Now, don't you worry, little Joe. Your day's coming a little later. <laughs> oh, this hair, are you kidding? Yes, I am. Hey, hey you kids! Run! All right, you kids! <laughs> Good luck, got some firecrackers. That ought to hold your pop gets out. Thank you, Joe. Right. After you, ma'am. Ah, she's a real pretty gal, ain't she, Duke? Guess that don't do Duke no good. She didn't even give him a tumble. Wait a minute, honey. I want to talk to you. What are you afraid of? All I want to do is talk to you and get acquainted. Just let me alone! Ain't you, Sheriff? Yeah, if it's old goat here, don't talk you out of getting married. <laughs> not a chance. <laughs> you? Hey, uh, you're, you're not gonna let him charge you full price for that, are you, Roy? Will you stop? <laughs> <laughs> Get in here. Get in here. Hey, come on, don't, don't cut too much off, will you? Now, no, you ain't gonna tell me how to cut your hair, are you, little Joe? Well, I just want to make sure my hat still fits, you know? Uh, be a little weight, boys. Uh, two ahead of you. Yeah, we got lots of time. Uh, just find yourself a chair someplace there. Don't, don't get carried away with the scissors, Frank. You in that chair. Just hold your head, Will. Would you mind letting me take your place? <laughs> you got to be kidding. I waited for two hours to get in this chair. <laughs> if you're willing to wait that long, you ought to be willing to wait a little while longer. Uh, like I told you, there's two ahead of yeah, you. Yeah, I know, but uh, I'm in a hurry. How about it? Well, you're going to wait your turn just like everybody else. <laughs> Go ahead, Frank. Yeah, but I'm not like anybody else. Well, that's good. This makes the difference. I better get out of the chair, mister. No sense getting killed over a little thing like a haircut. Duke here is so uh, touchy about the way he looks. You don't get out of that chair, you'll never have need of a haircut. Sure, listen to him, mister. Like I told you, he's touchy. I've seen too many mean local killers in my life not to recognize one when I see him. You shut up, old man. Better get out of that chair, little Joe, before he kills you. Now, you are getting out of that little chair, aren't you? Oh, yeah. What I'm going to remember you, mister... Why don't you sit over here, mister? Hey, Carlos. I'll need a shave. I would also like a shave. Por favor. What do you think you're doing? Carlos, get out of the chair. No, Joe. I know what he wants. But it is not right. If you want to shave, you will have to wait until after I get mine. Is 
Somebody tell him to get out of that chair before I kill him. Come on, Carlos. This is no time to be a hero. Get out of the chair. No, Joe. It's all right. He will wait. No man would kill for such a foolish reason. Por favor, Barber. Get busy with that ladder. Carlos, don't be a fool. Barber. Barber. I'm mighty particular about my hair. I don't want you to take too much off the top. Trim it nice and neat in the back. And keep the sideburns long. No sign of them? Not a thing. Joe, why don't you come inside? Have some supper with Paco and me. Paco's in there? Yeah. He has no relatives this side of Mexico. Roy Coffey wrote to his grandparents until he hears back. I, I told him I'd take care of the boy. Well, how's he feeling? How do you think he feels? Poor kid, every time I think about what happened in there, oh, Joe. Nothing you could do. It wasn't your fault. You're not responsible for Mr. Rodriguez's death. I know it wasn't my fault, Pa, but I just wish there was something I could have done. What could you have done? Sam Sneddon and Barbara told me what happened and how. Joe, sometimes situations arise and there's nothing you can do about them. Yeah, well, there's something I can do about it now. I can find Miller. I'll settle a fresh horse. Now we caught a couple of them. Frank Walter and Barn. Roy's got them in jail in Virginia City. Did you get the one that did the killing? Well, we don't know. According to them, they didn't have anything to do with it. I have to go into town, Pa. You be careful now. Right. <laughs> Tell me if one of these fellows is a killer, will you?
Blanco, how are you feeling? Joe? About my father. I know there's nothing you could have done. Thanks, Blanco. Howdy, Ben. Roy. Joe? Hey, Paco, got a letter for you. Oh, you heard from his grandparents then? Yeah. Good. I'm glad you were able to get in touch with him. And so was I. Well, trial all set? Yeah, but it's been changed over to Carson City. How come? Well, Duke Miller's lawyer claimed that he couldn't get an unbiased jury in Virginia City, so he pulled some legal strings and had the whole trial transferred over to Carson. Oh. Hey, Paco, let us meet Grandpa just come in this forenoon. Thank you, Senor Sheriff. He must have got himself a pretty smart lawyer. They just don't come no smarter. Wilson Reed's defendant. And Ben. Now, both Barbara and Sam are eyewitnesses to this murder. And their testimony should convict Miller. But I just don't want to take any chance on having any trouble to trial. So you get Joe to stay away from the trial. Huh? Now, Roy, Joe isn't going to start any trouble in a court of law. Roy, I'm going to that trial, whether you like it or not. Senor Cartwright? Yes, Paco. My grandfather, he wants me to go to Juarez. To live with him and Grandma. Well, that's good news, Paco. You'll be real happy living with your grandparents, won't you? We'll make arrangements to get you there as soon as possible. Senor Cartwright, I will stay here until they hang the man who killed my father. Boys, well, about that time. Deputy. Well, boys, this is your big day. How do you feel? Uh, half felt better, Mr. Reed. Have they caught Odie yet? No. It's a good thing for you that they haven't. Otherwise, you'd hang. You think he can get us off? There's a possibility. If there weren't, I wouldn't be defending you. Let's go. Oh, Mr. Reed. Uh, hmm? I ain't had a haircut in a long time, and I thought maybe uh, I hate to go into court looking so shabby. So if it's possible, I'd like to get a barber in here to sort of clean me up. Well, there's, uh, there's only one way that you'd ever get a barber in here. That's if the jury convicted you. They always grant a last request to a condemned man. And that would be your last request, wouldn't it, Duke? <laughs> Come on, boys. It's not smart to keep a judge waiting. And then when Mr. Rodriguez refused to get out of the chair, Duke Miller shot him. Shot him and killed him. And then while, while Rodriguez was lying dead on the floor, Duke Miller got into the chair. And then very calmly made Frank finish cutting his hair. You have heard the barber, Mr. Snedden, and now Mr. Cartwright tell how Carlos Rodriguez met his death. Never have I heard of such a cold-blooded killing. And never have I been able to offer such overwhelming evidence against a murderer. Your Honor, it isn't up to Mr. Albright to decide whether Duke Miller is a murderer. That's up to the jury. Until a decision is reached, I insist that Mr. Albright refrain from referring to Mr. Miller or one of the defendants as a murderer. You see that you do that, Mr. Albright. I'm sorry, Judge. Your witness. Mr. Cartwright, I, um, I understand that you were unconscious at the time of the killing. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct, but I, I came to immediately and... That's all. No more questions. He had the gun in his oh. hand. Your Honor. That's all, son. You can step down. Miller maintains that he never stepped foot inside that barber shop. But you have heard three men swear that Miller did come into that barber shop and that he murdered Carlos Rodriguez in cold blood right before their eyes. 
Gentlemen, there is no need for me to say more. If ever a man was guilty of murder and deserved to be hung, that man is Duke Miller. Now, I know you're going to find him guilty. And I know that he is going to hang. The state rests, Your Honor. All right. Well, Mr. Reed. Thank you, Your Honor. Gentlemen, you have heard the two defendants state that Joseph Cartwright tried to strangle Duke Miller in his cell in Virginia City. Now, I don't know why Joseph Cartwright wanted to kill Mr. Miller, but I do know that he hates him. So do you. Therefore, I want you to completely disregard his testimony. Because the testimony of a man full of hate is very unreliable. I object, Your Honor. I'll sustain that. Mr. Reed, I will instruct the jury what to disregard. I'm sorry. Your Honor, I would like for the barber and Mr. Snedden to come up here and take another look at Mr. Brennan and Mr. Miller. Objection, Your Honor. Just a minute. Now, uh... They've had plenty of time to see them, Mr. Reed. This isn't necessary for them to come back up here. And... Your Honor, I insist that they come up here and positively identify the defendants as two of the men who were in that barbershop. And I will prove them wrong. Now, there is no doubt that someone killed Carlos Rodriguez. But there is grave doubt, and I am certain that it was not Duke Miller. All right, Mr. Snedd and Mr. Thomas, come on up. Come on, come on. Come on, right up here. Now, gentlemen, if you'll stand right here in front of the defendants, and don't take your eyes off them. Uh, Mr. Reed, you're sure now that you're not taking up this court's time for nothing? Please bear with me, Your Honor. All right. Now, Mr. Brennan and Mr. Miller admit that they rode through Virginia City the day of the murder. They swore they did not go into the barber shop. They swore that they were not in the company of a third man. Now, maybe three men did enter that barber shop. I don't know. But Cal Brennan was not one of them, nor was Duke Miller. Mr. Uh, Snedden, why do you wear glasses? What do you think I wear them for? <laughs> because you have very poor eyesight. Well, I got good enough eyesight to know that these were the two that came into the barber shop that day. And that's the one that killed Carlos Rodriguez. And you can't disprove that. You bet you can't. We know who we saw. Then you still insist, you are still positive, that those are the two men that went into the barbershop? Yes. And could you identify the third man you claim went into the barbershop if you ever saw him again? I'm sure I could. So could I. Now, gentlemen... The prosecutor bases his entire case on an old man who has very poor eyesight and a barber who admits that he was terrified at the time the crime was committed. Now, I don't think that's sufficient evidence to hang a man. But I can see from the looks of your faces that you do. You still believe these witnesses. All right. I want you to go on believing them. I mean that. I want you to believe them. Because I'm going to base my entire defense on the fact that you do believe them. Even though I know and am certain of a fact that they are mistaken. Floyd! Do you recognize that man? That's the one. That's the other one that came into the barbershop with them. That's him, all right. And you both positively identify him as the man who came into the barbershop on February the 2nd with Calvin Brennan and Duke Miller. I'm positive he's the one. There ain't no doubt about it. That's all, gentlemen. You may go back to your seats. Your Honor, the man the two witnesses just identified is Floyd Brennan, Calvin Brennan's brother. 
Take off his hat. Calvin isn't very proud of his brother Floyd because he's a criminal. As soon as he is through here, the two deputies will escort him back to his jail cell in Kingman, where he's been incarcerated for more than a year. Now, I object, Your Honor. What kind of a charge? All right, all right, all right. All right, Mr. Reed, go ahead. Thank you. Gentlemen, they said they were positive. Positive that this man was in the barbershop. But on that fatal day, Floyd Brennan was locked up in jail more than 500 miles away from Virginia City. So how in God's name can you believe anything those witnesses have said? You can't, gentlemen. You can't. Floyd Brennan was not in that barbershop. Cal Brennan was not in that barbershop. Duke Miller was not in that barbershop. So, gentlemen, you can't. You can't possibly bring in a verdict of guilty unless you are willing to make a mockery of the word justice. Quiet. What? Quiet, please! <clears throat> you gentlemen reach the verdict? We have, Your Honor. The defendants, please stand up. How do you find? We find both the defendants not guilty. <laughs> not guilty! Joseph! Joseph! Not guilty, Your Honor. How much proof do you need? There were three eyewitnesses that uh, saw just, Miller kill Mr. A, Rodriguez. Just a minute. Now, the jury has handed down a decision. It stands. What kind of a decision? What proof do you need? Now, that is enough. Oh, no, it's not enough. Get it, get it. Get it, get it. Get it, get it. Did you hear me? Stop it. Young man, that is going to cost you 30 days in jail. Oh, really, I could probably get that sentence cut considerably, Judge, if I could afford Mr. Reed for an I attorney. I said be quiet. <laughs> Your Honor. My son has been under great strain for the past couple of weeks. I beg the court's indulgence. All right. All right, Mr. Conrad. Well, let me tell you this. Let me tell all of you this. Duke Miller was tried in a proper court of law, and he was declared innocent. Now, if anyone decides to reverse that decision by putting a bullet into Duke Miller, the killer will be tried in my courtroom, and I promise you he will be hanged by the neck until dead. This court stands adjourned. In my whole life, what we saw, we saw Miller kill Paco's father right in front of our eyes. And and, and just because that jury Roy, happened to be... A... Roy, what are we going to do about it? Are we just going to stand around and do nothing while that murder's in there go free, are we? You know what we ought to do? We ought to go in there, pull him out of jail, and hang him up ourselves. That's, That's the first sensible thing I've heard all day. Now, wait a minute, boys. We come over here to Carson City to attend a trial. Now, that trial's over. But... Just because a smart lawyer happened... Now look, he was tried according to law. The jury brought in a verdict of not guilty. Now, no matter how any of us feel, there's not going to be any hanging, legally or illegally. Uh, Joseph, what happened in there is final. You heard what the judge said. There'll be no more trouble. So let's get on home.
How's Paco feeling? I thought I could use a glass of milk. I'll bring it up to him. With a gun in your hand? I try to talk to him. All he wants to do is kill Duke Miller personally. Yeah, well, don't you worry about him killing Duke Miller, Bob. Because I'm going to do it for him. Evidently, all I've taught you means nothing. That boy upstairs needs help. He's being eaten away by hate. He won't listen to me. But he likes you, Joseph. So you talk to him. He admires you. You advise him. Tell him that the sacred book lies. Tell him that vengeance belongs to Joe Cartwright and Paco Rodriguez. Tell him that the courts are to be obeyed only when they decide in our favor. Tell him there's no such thing as human dignity or decency. You tell him that men have the God-given right to turn themselves into jungle animals. Go ahead. Tell him that. Isn't that what you believe? <laughs> Your little milk. I don't want any. Come on, do you some good. Take a little bit anyway. Do you mind if we do a little talking? I don't mind. My well, family and I have been talking downstairs, and uh, we think it might be a good idea if you went to your grandparents right away. My grandparents will not see Paco until my father's death has been avenged. You're going to kill the man who took my father's life, and I'm going to help you. You meant it, didn't you? Yes, I meant it when I said it, Paco. Let me try to explain something to you. When a fellow grows up like I have, he, he sometimes says things when he's angry. He forgets some of the truths that he learned when he was a boy. What truth? Well, wh wh where does a man go when he dies, Paco? A good man. To heaven. And where does a bad man go when he dies? To hell. Yes, that's where he goes. Because nobody goes unpunished, Paco. The man who killed my father, he must be punished now. The court said he's innocent, even though we know he's guilty. Now, that's because the courts are not perfect, Paco. But God is. Yes, but... You believe in God, don't you? Yes. All right, then you must believe that God will punish Duke Miller. Look, I know it's hard. It's hard for you and it's hard for me. But, son, if you believe in God, then you must believe that. You want me to go to my grandparents in Juarez? And leave vengeance to God? Yes, that's what I want. I don't want to, but... If you go with me, little Joe, I'm ready. Well, look, I, uh, I got a lot of things to do around here. Maybe, maybe Horse or Adam could take you. What things? If you believe that we must leave vengeance to God, what things have you got to do?
We'll leave tomorrow. Well, it just about makes a load, don't it? Yep. Hey, Hoss, finish tying this stuff on for me. Right. Yeah, Pa. Just want you to know that I appreciate you volunteering to take pocket of his pants. Well, I didn't exactly volunteer to take him. But... <laughs> well, but I do want your word that you're going straight to Juarez. Nowhere else. I couldn't very well go chasing after Miller in a wagon load of supplies. No. But I also want your word that you're not going to go after Miller afterwards either. And if you happen to bump into him, no guns. All right, you have my word. You really mean that? He asked me to talk to Paco last night, talk things out with him. Mm -hmm. What you were really asking me to do was talk things out with myself, wasn't it? I guess I better get Paco and tell him time to go. Adiós, padre. in your cart, right? Trying to prove. Oh, it's a nice town. Who knows? You might see that Cartwright kid again. Ain't worth it, Duke. You ain't forgot how you killed that Mexican. You're pressing your luck. Hey, fellas! Why don't you go in and say hello to the sheriff? to have this table. Do you mind? Well, there's plenty of tables. Can't you see? Yeah, I know, but I like to have this one. Look, I said this. Pl Hello, Sam. Sam! You remember me, don't you? 
You got a lot of gold showing your face in this town. Damn. Let bygones be bygones. You show you I ain't mad at you? Trying to get me hung? I'm gonna pay for your dinner. How's that? I ain't gonna eat with the likes of you. When I ain't sitting with the likes of you. Sit down, old man. How's your friend Cartwright? Still pushy as ever? You'd find out soon enough if he knew you was in town. Well, that's exactly what I want him to know. You know where to find him? I know where to find him. Will you tell him I'm here? Yes. I'll tell him you're here. And I'll tell the sheriff, too. You skunks are back in town. This place is too fancy for me. Go next door and have a drink. Oh, look who's here. Hello, can I talk to you now? Just let me alone, will you? What's the matter with you? Why are you being so standoffish? I'm not such a alone. bad guy. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you look kind of shaggy, Duke. Maybe better clean up and uh, give it another try, huh? Maybe you're right. Come on. Hey, where you going? Love a boy wants a haircut. What else? That's, that's what Sam told me. Father? I wouldn't do it. I'll be right with you. Need a haircut. Uh, we're closed up. I said I need a haircut. I, I, I told you we're closed up. You're open now. What's the matter, Barber? Are you glad to see me? Come on, he's not going to you. Come on. Want the same kind of haircut you gave me the last time? Sure, sure, Mr. Miller. You know, the last time I was here, I left in such a hurry, I forgot to pay you. So this time, I'm going to pay you double. How's that? Uh, fine, fine, Mr. Miller. That's... back in town and them two fellers is with him. They're over in the barbershop. I couldn't find a sheriff. Let's go get him. I'll take his rifle. Leave it alone, Sam. We don't want anything to do with him. What in tarnation's wrong with you? You said after a trial you was going to get him. Yeah, well, I changed my mind. Little Joe, what you going to do? Anything about it? Remember the talk we had last night, Paco? You remember what we talked about? Well, I meant what I said. Paco, I believe what I said. I'm gonna go in the bank and cash that draft. I want you to sit here in the wagon and wait for me, just like I told you. I never thought I'd live to see the day when a Cartwright would turn coward. Little Joe's no coward. He said God will punish this man. In due time, Paco, in due time. But I still say little Joe's a coward. And so would your father if, if he hadn't been killed by them three skunks down there in that barber shop.
about right. Buck, are you all right? Yeah. I had to come. My father wasn't a coward. I can't be either. I understand. All right, Duke, nobody's hurt. Let the kid go. Get out, kid. Not you, Cartwright. You stay. Going back to the wagon. What are you going to do? Just go on back to the wagon. Put your guns away, fellas. I want this nice and legal. I want him bruised up so he'll never forget us. Just let him go. Frank, you did a beautiful job. Yeah, I figure that's one of the best jobs I've ever done. Let me out of this chair! We're gonna let you out of the chair. I don't want you to go out without your tie. Because we'd like you to see the job we did. Don't let anybody see me like this, please. Please don't let anybody see me like this. Everybody's gonna see you! No! Go on, let him see you, Duke! Go ahead, let him see you! Enough. That's 
that you cry. You get it all out, Buckle. I don't. You've done all you can do. Why don't we go home? Go home. Big cat. Big cat up by the herd. Hey, what happened? Joe's horse stumbled. Get to the car and get the doctor, quick. Oh, he's a big one, Pop. He's the biggest one I've ever seen. He's gonna raise Cain with those cattle up there. Oh, don't worry about that now. Is Cochise all right? Yeah. yeah. She's all right. She's luckier than you. I don't even know what it was. I didn't see a thing. It must have been a chuckle or something. When I saw you fall, Joe, for a moment, it was just like your mother. The same way that afternoon, she came riding up to the house. There's so much of her in you, Joe. So much. Fine instrument, eh, monsieur? 35 inches of authority. Yes, sir. Excuse me, sir. Are you Marius Angeville? A bit worn in the tooth, a little bit sour in the stomach, but the very same. Well, I'm glad I found you, sir. My name is Ben Cartwright. Should I know you? Oh, no, sir, no. I, I've just arrived in New Orleans. I, I have a ranch up in Nevada. Oh, you've come a long way, monsieur. Yes, sir. Around the Cape. By a ship? By Clipper. A fine voyage? Yes, sir. Ah, how I missed that. Sir, there was a man worked on my ranch. He was from New Orleans. Name of Jean de Marigny. John, it's been so long. Is he well? Happy? No, sir. He's dead. John, he was like my own son. His last thoughts were of you and his wife. I promised I'd see you both. And, of course, his mother. <laughs> his mother... Forgive me. But 
there are some things... I'm sorry to have to bring you such bad news, Madame de Marigny. I hope that it might bring you some consolation to know of your son's courage. I'm growing old, monsieur, and quite dry of tears. The de Marinese carry a proud but bitter heritage. We cried at the death of the emperor. We cried in the streets of New Orleans when the French flag came down. And I cried when my son ran away from his disgrace. His disgrace, madame? You knew little about him. Only that he had separated from his wife, whom he loved very dearly. Love is often a crown of thorns. Yes, yes, I suppose that's true. I hope to see his wife, Marie. I do not wish to discuss her, monsieur. Well, madame, she is your son's wife. Marie Delval was never meant to be the wife of a de Marigny. Forgive me, monsieur, but that is not your concern. If I can be of service while you are in New Orleans. Oh, thank you, madame. There, there is one thing. Oui? I brought a shipment of raw furs with me from Nevada. I was hoping I might dispose of them while I'm here. But I have little connection with my husband's business, monsieur. Well, Jean suggested that I contact your late husband's partner. He might arrange to sell my furs for me in the Parisian market. I shall be happy to introduce you to monsieur Clermont. Thank you. I will arrange for a meeting and notify you. Excellent. Where are you staying? Oh, with a friend. Uh, Marius Angerville in the Passage de la Bourse. You know Marius Angerville? Well, yes, he's, he's a friend of your son's. Uh... That one is no friend to my son. Bonjour, monsieur. Thank you, madame. Good day. Jean's mother wasn't too friendly toward me. She isn't exactly fond of her daughter-in-law, is she? Well, she isn't, never was. I'm afraid Marie isn't very fond of me. We may not receive a warm reception, my boy. I haven't seen her since the day Jean left New Orleans. Jean told me that you were very good friends. Mm -hmm. We were, until I challenged her beloved cousin, Edouard Darcy, to a duel. She's never forgiven me for wanting to kill him, which I was most anxious to do. about the time you rode into the Salle d'Orléans in the middle of a ball. Uh, no, André, I, I have no more time for tales. Marius Angeville. I thought by now the devil had claimed her for his own. I'm afraid both you and he will have to wait a trifle longer. I brought a friend to meet you. Fresh from the wilderness, Marie. May I present Monsieur Cartwright from Virginia City, Nevada? Madame. I've heard there is such a place. Yes, ma'am, I'm afraid there is. Full of wild animals and much wilder people. Now, if you'll forgive me, I'm going to the bar. Madame, may I speak with you in private? Monsieur, is that a Western custom, demanding a lady's attention on such short acquaintance? What I have to say is rather serious. Serious? Why, no one is serious here. People come here for pleasure. What I have to say, it's about your husband. Harry, I thought you were going to join us. A little cognac, Renee, please. 
It seems the game-legged old Hotspur himself has decided to distinguish us with a visit. Why not, Darcy? We will squat in hell together, you and I. If you're in a hurry to get there, Hotspur, I'm always available to assist you on your way. Next time, the boot may be on the other foot. I am pleased to have met you, monsieur. Marie, please hurry. Monsieur, I do not wish to discuss my husband. I, I think you had better leave. Is your husband of no interest to you? Of uh, no interest whatsoever. I'm afraid there's something that you don't uh, there know. There is nothing I wish to know about Jean. Bonjour, monsieur. Monsieur. My name is Darcy. I'm the proprietor here. How do you do, sir? Are you a friend of Marius? Yes, in a way. You don't seem to be attracted to our little sport. <laughs> Most Americans find it very stimulating. I didn't come here to gamble. I'm afraid I'm not exactly attracted to blind chance. <laughs> Perhaps you're attracted more by aesthetic things? And if I am? Oh, well, that would surprise me. You lack a certain polish in your technique. I guess my polish has been dulled by hard work, monsieur. Good night. I fought amid the grape shot and bullets of Waterloo. A saber in my hand, with valiant men, honorable men. You've had too much to drink, Marius. Don't tell me what I've had. In vino veritas, in wine, there is truth. Let me help you. What is it? An old wound. This afternoon, it became as fresh as the day I received it. Defending the honor of an old friend. Ah, oh, Jean, Jean, you came to me, but I failed you. We all failed you. married. He adored his young and beautiful wife. But when he believed her unfaithful, he ran. His whole world shattered. Mm -hmm. Now I'm beginning to understand why Madame de Marigny didn't want to talk about her. I never believed the stories spread about Marie. I tried to prove them false. She was the innocent victim of deceit. What was the truth? The real facts about what happened are locked in her heart, along with grief and disillusionment. Again. I'm a stubborn man, madame. Please go away. I will, as soon as you give me a chance to talk to you. I know all I need to know about Jean. Do you know that he's dead? I'm sorry. That's what I've been trying to tell you. 
He made me promise to seek you out and let you know. Thank you. I'm sorry I had to give it the news so bluntly, but you left me little choice. Go on, monsieur. John died after saving my life. He was a brave and courageous man. I accept your statement, monsieur, but it does not fit the Jean de Marigny I knew. He asked me to tell you that he loved you. Love. He didn't know what it meant to love. A man on his deathbed doesn't lie. All right, you've told me. Now, good day, monsieur. Well, that isn't all he asked me to say to you. I'm not interested. He asked me to say that he forgave you. Forgave me? As his words were, he loved you and he forgave you. For what? He believed a horrible lie. It was absurd. He couldn't have accepted it and really loved me. Instead of trusting me, he ran off, leaving me disgraced and humiliated. Where was he when I needed him? When my baby needed him? I didn't know there was a child. There is no child. His mother took him from me at birth. He died of the fever. Jean never told me about that. Did he know? If he knew, would he have cared? Leave me alone, monsieur, please. Well, you have speed and accuracy, but your long lunge and cart left you open to my repost. You're too anxious for the kill. I'm an impatient woman, Marius. That could be the death of you. Another about three, three touches. I'm tired. You didn't come here for a fencing lesson, Marie. Not after all this time. I'm not sure why I came. I'm not sure of anything anymore. Well, I can't give you any fatherly advice. There are no words to prevent memories from coming back to haunt you. You remind me of a, a gaunt old tree, gnarled and sad, all covered with Spanish moss and standing up to your knees in dark water. You've been a loyal friend, Marius. Even though you, you were wrong about my cousin Edouard. He's been very good to me. I, I, I think I wanted to tell you I'm sorry. Oh, please don't run off on my account. I'll be out of your way. Marius told me you wouldn't be here today. I came back sooner than I'd planned. I was out walking around your magnificent city. I I'm sorry if I've been rude, but you just don't understand. Allow me. New Orleans is a strange city, strange and unpredictable. There's none other like it in the world. I find the people rather difficult to understand, too. They're a blend of so many things. Yes. Good and evil. Bitterness and sorcery and virtue. You could live a lifetime and find nothing worse than warm sunshine or bubbles and honey. Or you might suddenly become aware of the most... the most... terrible rottenness. The West is like that, too. Out West there are trees that... that 
touch they blew the sky. Unimaginably beautiful. Yet there's an anger and violence about nature that seems to be there just to test people. But it hardens them too, makes them strong and unfeeling. It's a man's country. Are you going back soon? Yes. I thought maybe before I go, maybe we could have supper together. And I promise not to talk about anything more personal than bubbles and honey. I'm sorry. Good day, monsieur. Bonjour, Marius. She's like a woman possessed. One moment gay and full of life, the next driven, running to escape from something that seems to chase her. Well, she loses herself in her way, and I in mine. It'll learn to recover from sorrow. I did from mine. Did you? I think not. You're still nursing your wounds, just like me. I learned to forget, Marius. Marie can't forget. A husband who deserted her, a mother-in-law who loathed her. They had to be married secretly to avoid her interference. What about this, uh, this other man, the one who was supposed to? Well, I never found out who he was. One of Darcy's friends, perhaps. I tried to make Jean see the truth. But it was no use. Well, it isn't my affair. I have my own responsibilities. Jean saved your life. He gave you this responsibility. Just a minute, Marius. I paid my debt to Jean. How? By bringing us the sad tale of his death? By bargaining with his mother to sell your furs? Those furs represent a year's work. I need the money to expand my ranch. Besides, what the devil could I do here that you have not been able to do? You could help me find the other man. Oh, that happened years ago. Wouldn't help Jean now anyway. It's a dead issue. Not to me! And Marie isn't a dead issue either. You could talk to her. Make her see that Darcy isn't what she thinks. That he isn't trying to help her. That he wants only to fulfill his own ambitions by marrying her off to some fat aristocrat. Well, what makes you think she'd listen to me? Anyway, I'm not going to get involved. I have two sons. I'm going to get back to them. Well, maybe you're right, my boy. Why bother with other people's agonies when you have your own to keep you company? I do not compromise with situations, Madame de Marigny. Then you are aware that this man is a threat, such as Angerville never was. I can see the possibility. I'm not overly disturbed by it. He's young, aggressive, and he feels a debt of gratitude to my son. All very subversive attributes. I view this matter of the American's intrusion with utmost gravity. There is no cause for alarm, madame. The man I persuaded to be attentive to your son's wife is now residing on the island of Haiti. He could come back. The American could get the truth out of him. And if he searches hard enough, he could discover from various sources that Marie's child is not dead. That could lead to the most undesirable results. I want him to leave New Orleans. I have arranged for his furs to be bought so that he will have no excuse to stay. But just in case he is stubborn, I want him out of here. Do you understand? I understand perfectly, madame. If you can afford the expense, I can afford the inconvenience. Madame.
I saw you from the street, madame. May I? I come here often. I was brought up in the convent after my parents died. It's a beautiful place. I was happy here. I was something of a rebel. Yes, I think I can imagine you as a rebel. I used to climb that tree and look over the wall, fascinated by the beautiful French ladies in their Paris gowns, with shining black hair and skin like roses. I couldn't wait to wash my face in sour buttermilk. <laughs> when I was a boy, I used to stand on a pier and watch the great clipper ships putting out to sea. I used to imagine myself a captain on a quarterdeck, scanning the horizon, looking for rich new lands to discover. For a long time, I had to content myself with finding my heroes in books. I think that was far better than if they disillusion you, you, you can throw them into the fire. It's getting late. May I, uh, may I walk you home? Who are your heroes, Marie? Don John of Austria, Henri of Navarre, Cardinal Richelieu. Bold, forceful men. Perfect heroes for a young Creole girl who hasn't the vaguest ideas about love and life. You seem to have some definite ideas now. About life? We don't live, we're only in the expectation of living. And love? To love is to place one's happiness in someone else's hands. I see so much of my own loneliness in you. Marie. I know I have no right to ask. What happened that night? I, I was alone. Sean had finally worked up the courage to, to tell his mother we'd been married. But he wanted to do it by himself. I must have been sleeping for some time when I, I became aware of someone near me. I thought it was Jean. When I realized it wasn't, I struggled. That's when Jean came in the room. It must have been terrible for you. He should have believed me. Yes. He should have. His mother was anxious to believe the lie. Something should have been done about that lie a long time ago, Marie. Hello, you're becoming, cousin. That Marius and his American friend are becoming regular customers. That's Monsieur Clermont with his back to us at the table. Um, wait for me at the bar. Leave Marius alone, Edouard. Uh, don't concern yourself. My quarrel with the old Hotspur is ancient history. Mr. Clermont, I'm Ben Cartwright. Oh, it is a pleasure to meet you, monsieur. I got your note and came as quickly as I could. Oh, yes, yes, uh, about the furs. Madame de Marigny spoke to me. Uh, you play poker, monsieur Cartwright? Well, I, I thought you wanted to discuss business, sir. Oh, certainly, my boy, certainly. Uh, I have a room in a bag reserved for our negotiation. Uh, won't you join us for a little while, and we'll discuss business later. Please do join us, monsieur. Thank you. I have one vice. Cards. Mm. 
Well, gentlemen, I have three queens. Ah, Monsieur Darcy, have you had the pleasure of meeting Monsieur Cartwright? Yes. He's the gentleman who does not devote himself to blind chance. He's certainly doing well with it tonight. Throw a lucky man into the Nile, says an old Arabian proverb, and he'll come up with a fish in his mouth. <laughs> Monsieur Clermont, I hope my luck will improve tomorrow. Monsieur, enchanté. Thank you. May I join in? Please do. I believe you, Monsieur Cartwright. I'll pay for the pleasure of seeing your hand, Monsieur Cartwright. Incredible luck. It's your deal. Marius, won't you join me? Thank you. Monsieur Cartwright, may I see those cards? a cheat and a thief. Darcy, you cut those cards. Barbarian. You accuse me while you uncouth backwards. I demand a satisfaction for this insult, monsieur. The plantation allowed at dawn. Weapons, rapiers. Bonne nuit. He can't fence Darcy and you know it. If he doesn't wish to satisfy me, he better conduct himself out of town immediately. You won't need to do either. Maurice, you stay out of this. I'm already in it. This is my affair. Now stop interfering. You can have him when I'm through with him. How popular I am. Gentlemen, it'll be a pleasure to do business with both of you. Whoever is first is immaterial. We let the cards decide. Now, Marius, listen to me. Edward, no, please. Marie, you stay out of this. Marius, will you please with cards? Be ridiculous. All right, I'll cut them for you. Yours, queen. Mine, king. You lose, my boy. All right, Darcy. The Oak Grove, a large plantation at dawn. Perfectly satisfactory. Now, Marius, I'm Come not along, my boy. Marius, will you? Come along! Edward, no, please. Monsieur Cartwright is no match for your rapier. He knows nothing of such things. And Marius is an old man. He's crippled. Why are you so concerned about Mr. Cartwright? Oh, come on, Marius. I was tricked into that duel. You... Of course you were. Why? Obviously, you're considered a threat. A threat? To what? To whom? By whom? Obviously, again, by Madame de Marigny. Which is why she's hired Darcy to arrange your convenient demise. Well, it's still my fight and I won't have you interfere. My dear boy, do you actually believe you could meet Darcy in a cartel with rapiers? The man's a professional duelist. He's killed four men. He half crippled me, a fencing master. 
Well, then we'll have to find some other way to settle it, that's all. There is no other way. Unless I kill the man first, he'll kill you. Marius, I'm not helpless. I may not be a fencer, but I can hold my own with the best of them, with my fists or with practically any kind of firearm. It's too late for that. He's maneuvered you, so he has the choice of weapons. You'd better understand me, Marius. I'm not leaving town. And I'm not going to let you do my fighting for me. And there's something you must understand. I have been given another chance, and you're not taking it from me. You have everything. A great future. Sons. For me, there is only honor. Without it, I'm nothing. Honor. The word hangs in the air of New Orleans like the refrain of a song. I taught you the art of fencing, Marie. I taught you the code that holds men to the high standard of honor and courtesy. The code? Marius, this time you will die. I know it. Perhaps, but with dignity. Ken, Marius is just trying to save you. He can't win. He's not going to have a chance to try. Ben! I've heard all I want to hear, Marius. The discussion is over. Well, maybe you're right, my boy. Maybe it's just the stubborn pride of an old man. What about you? How are you going to fight, Darcy? I thought your concern was for Marius. I love the dear man. But... But what? My concern isn't only for Marius. I just saw Marius and Darcy headed for the Oaks. Fool. You'll have to show me where they hold those stupid duels. My carriage is outside. No wound. Continue. you are, Darcy. A hired assassin fighting an old man. You're a white-livered, cowardly disgrace to yourself and your so-called coat of honor. I 
I consider that a challenge which supersedes our previous arrangement. My choice of weapon is pistols. Here and now. Agreeable, monsieur. Andre, the pistols. Not fire, monsieur. You will live, Darcy. If you tell the truth about Marie and the man you hired to disgrace her. You know nothing of the matter of honor. Fire and be done with it! Honor. What do you know about honor? about Marie. Tell him! Yes, yes. Madame de Marigny arranged the whole thing through me. as he wanted to, according to the code by which he lived. The code? I'm sick to death of the code! Of all this stupid, shallow desperation that drives decent men to destroy themselves. Look at this hanging moss with its slime and sickness, like this proud society that builds a wall around itself and shuts out the world. Marie, there's a world beyond that wall. The real world. A beautiful world. Where trees touch the sky? Yes, where trees touch the sky and they grow straight and tall and clean. Where life is reborn every moment, every day. Not for me. Death follows me. Only in the past. Only in the past. There's life ahead for you. For us. Without you. It would be empty for me. Empty? But with your sons, the future you're building for them? Until I came here, I thought my life was quite full. 
My sons were all I needed. But now I know, without you, it could never be complete. Come back with me. Be my wife. I love you. Ben, I love you. A little time we had together, your mother and I, here in the Ponderosa. From the time we were married, until the time you were born. Until that day she came, riding up to the house, and fell. Doctor's on his way, Paul. Well, brother, I thought you was half dead. Are you all right? Yeah, sure, I'm all right. Take more than that fool horse to get rid of me. Why does this always happen at the beginning of haying season? Just plain lucky, I guess. <laughs> <laughs>